put it out there, don't we? So here's uh, the update will be on non-financial reporting as I call it. I'll get back on the right screen. So I advanced the right thing here. Uh, our, the objectives are to just uh, get folks to um, get a background on what these frameworks, the new expectations, and we're gonna do it by uh, running through the four topics uh, listed there. Um, here's our click to receive in advance like we did on the last slide. So here's just a little background on the non-financial reporting. And what better way to start a background than to begin with a polling question? So I'd appreciate if everybody go to your, um, the path, pathable platform and indicate uh, what is your company's commitment to sustainability or ESG? What's it look like? So while we wait, Doug, a question mm -hmm. on how do we join the conference, the ESG that you talked about? There should be, um, it should be on the IIA website under events, training and events, I think it is. The announcement is there. I don't know if registration is open. If you're connected with me on LinkedIn, well, if you're not, you can, uh, but I will for sure post on LinkedIn when the registration for that is open. Um, and it'll be on my website. So uh, thank you for the question. Hope to see you there. It looks like the commitment is pretty good. The transparency still has a way to go. Um, and I'm glad that there weren't too many answers down there to the bottom saying, oh, it's just lip service. Um, there's still some of that around and it's our job as auditors to, uh, to root that out. So, you know, why, why do this? Why put out a, an ESG report or sustainability report? There are many different reasons in, in many places it's required. It's a market differentiator. It can drive non-financial value. It's a social license to operate is uh, what's often covered. There are a lot of different avenues for non-financial reporting. You go to the government website, a lot of it's compliance. Um, I think one of the avenues that we won't cover today, but is huge really, is B2B non-financial reporting. Uh, that's another whole area of risk that is, uh, is worth a part three session that we'll do maybe in, in a conference another day. Uh, but historical highlights, uh, this, you know, this goes back to just Y2K. Um, at that point, the first GRI guidelines were being published at the Global Reporting Initiative. Carbon Disclosure Project grew up, later changed their name to CDP. Um, the International Integrated Reporting Council was formed in 2010 with an, a goal of increasing the reporting on ESG and building that into financial reports. One of the reasons CDP changed their name was they got into the water business in 2010, realizing that climate was not the only environmental threat, but water is another one. All of the standards and frameworks have changed over the years. GRI uh, published 3.1 in 2011. In 2013, GRI published G4 with a big change in gender focused and gender parity and disclosure of pay rates uh, by gender in different classes of employment. So they were way ahead of the diversity and inclusion. Um, the EU directive came out and it's starting pretty soon that companies will have to submit uh, non-financial reports to the uh, publish them in the EU. Uh, <clears throat> In 2017, the Task Force on uh, Climate Change Related Financial Disclosures finalized their recommendations. The uptake of that has just been breathtaking. Um, in 2018, SASB, I, I hold a credential from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. They completed their developments of 77 industry specific standards. So even in 2020, um, you know, people thought ESG would kind of take a rest in 2020, uh, but with Larry Fink's letter, output from the World Economic Forum, uh, global leaders committing to, to this uh, activity on convergence of standards and even a merger of some of these groups, th this, if anything, it, it's gaining steam. Um, 
So when it comes to non-financial reporting, who, who's looking at all of it? Well, basically everybody. Um, what are they looking at? Well, basically everything that's out there. And why are they looking at it? They're looking at it for a lot of reasons. What, what standards are needed? What regulations are needed? What commitments should we make as a company? Where do I want to go to work? Um, who do I want in my supply chain? What is a brand risk for associating with me? whose advertisements do we take or, or, or link up with? So it, it's really the, the activity and the connection is all the way throughout the enterprise. So when it comes to ESG, which topic, here's another polling question, is most material to your organization? Let's take a minute here on the um, vote here, see what's coming in. Okay, um, diversity and inclusion is the runaway winner. Workplace conditions and safety, can't imagine that was influenced by COVID. Climate change is a, is a winner. Um, and the, the numbers are changing. So as people vote, the priorities are changing, but there are a lot of topics most material to the organization. And um, that just shows you the work that, that's uh, cut out for all of us when it comes to managing the risk. I'm going to touch briefly on updates on standards and frameworks. Um, GRI is uh, as a way of background. Um, they're what I call kind of the encyclopedia of, of all the taxonomy of all the ESG issues and frameworks. Some are mandatory, some are uh, sector specific, some are suggested. But if you want to report on an ESG topic, there's probably guidance for you here in GRI or, or it's in the works. Um, it, uh, KMP, KPMG published a good survey just a couple months ago showing how the adoption of GRI has increased over the years. Um, the base year 2011 or 2017 there on the left, but the takeaway here is that the numbers are only going up. Um, there's also the CDP, formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. Um, at the outset, they were founded because uh, there was a lot of clamor for regulations to control greenhouse gas emissions. The regulations were slow in coming. So the founders of CDP said, well, let's let companies disclose. And, and once they're disclosed, at least we have them on the path to compile their greenhouse gas emissions. And then maybe they'll step up and various pressures will arise so that companies will take action and reduce them because that's after all what we're after, a reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions and the reduction of the effects of climate change. So um, they have a rating and ranking list as well. Uh, companies submit to CDP. Their reports are public. CDP reviews them and analyzes them for both the way you disclose and your performance and do you have targets and is there governance? And they rate companies. So they announced uh, 313 companies in their A list, but there's still 3,700 companies on their F list. So they know who's been naughty and nice. They publish a list, which is available and used by investors in making their decisions. And they re get requests from uh, investors with assets under management that are north of $100 trillion. So their output goes into making investment decisions a few years back, I helped the company with submittal on the water reporting questionnaire. Here are some examples of questions. They're qualitative, they're quantitative, they go to governance, they go to commitment, they go to goals. Well, in, in about six years, uh, the categories of questions have, have grown into level of detail and all the ways it impacts it is embedded into business strategy for water. And here is one page of 11 for the questionnaire for water use. This isn't even greenhouse gas emissions. This is water use that goes to CDP 
then all these results are graded and the grades and the reports are available to investors. So this is a big change just in the last five years and all the expectations that come with it. I mentioned SASB, it was founded by uh, Michael Bloomberg and several people from uh, the SEC boards of directors and SEC ex-chairs are uh, on the board and have been in leadership positions for this. Very influential. Um, they went about, uh, the, the investment community was looking for meaningful disclosures, whereas GRI lets you disclose on anything and everything you kind of pick, although you're supposed to take into account stakeholder uh, demands. SASB really was looking for um, compl verifiable disclosures for things that are material as applied by the definition by the U.S. Supreme Court under securities law. No new law was required for SASB disclosures. The way I put it is that investors were looking for this in, in management discussion analysis in the 10K and they weren't finding it. And the company response was always, well, we can't figure out what's material. We don't know what to report on. And some folks got together and said, fine, we'll figure that out for you. And that became SASB and, and there became the standards. So these standards are required uh, by SEC law. SEC just put up with the, came up with the uh, approach to get to it. Um, they're merging now with the integrated International Integrative Reporting Council in a few months that was just announced. Um, the SASB leadership will be taking over the value re reporting re uh, foundation. I, I see that as a good sign because SASB was much further along on this than, than IIRC. The late entry to the fold is the task force on climate change related, uh, climate related financial disclosures um, with climate change really impacting every business, every organization. Um, it was strongly felt by some of the folks in SEC and the investment community that every company has got to do disclosures on climate change. So they created TCFD, the um, Financial Stability Board, created the TCFD in conjunction with SASB and a, a network of investors and analysts and their standards just came out three years ago, 2017. In three years, nearly 60% of the world's 100 largest public companies have announced support for TCFD or they report in line with TCFD recommendations or both. Uh, this has been discussed at the World Economic Forum. There have been commitments to this at the World Economic Forum. The big four are behind this because they would like to do assurance of these kind of disclosures. There's a lot of push on TCFD. The supporters include uh, 1,300 companies, 168 organizations. Um, the organizations, some of them are governments, some of them are industry associations that are working with industries to provide guidance on how to do it or to convene forums on how to come up with these disclosures. Um, there are some 100 regulators and government organizations on board, um, Belgium, and I think that's Canada and not Candy, um, Chile, France, and the UK, some, some large economies, US is not on board yet. Um, I think we'll see more countries on board with that uh, because after all, investments are global, um, funds are global, and uh, the investors like to, to look at um, everything that they can get. The disclosures are in four broad categories. Um, governance at, at a company, your strategy, how are you managing the risk? Well, what are the risks? We, we looked a few minutes ago at water shortage and prolonged drought and sea level rise and availability of resources and trade routes. I mean, there's any number of risks. So, so what are they? Um, what is your management of those risks? What are your metrics and targets when it comes to the risks and your business entity and emissions and everything that goes from those risks? <clears throat> and um, the TCFD published a report at year end 2020. Um, the disclosures are still ramping up. Uh, the quality of them and the detail of them is, uh, is still ramping up. 
but as the investors have looked at the disclosures made so far, here are the five uh, types of disclosures they have found the most useful. Um, and the first one, see, how does it affect your business? Um, it's not an inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, which is coming from um, CDP, but that's this is a cue here on why CDP is changing their questions to go to business strategy and link to risk and long-term viability of the business. Um, so here are, there, there's a whole list of disclosures and, and some that they have found not so useful. I didn't put on here, but I think the, uh, the report also goes into kind of a usefulness gap, if you will, that some of the disclosures they feel are, the investors feel are important but the disclosures are not all that useful at this point in time. So they will look for improvements in these disclosures in the years to come. Um, and along those lines, only uh, one in 15 of the disclosures were describing the company's resilience based upon the climate related risk. So if any of those extreme weather events hit, what do you do as a company? How are you positioned to respond? How are you positioned to um, continue your business or adjust your business strategy? And, and think about, um, we, we've had a lot of test of business resilience with COVID in the last year. So climate change related risk is moving a little slower than that, but it is no less pervasive. So, so what are your plans to respond to, to be resilient in the face of climate change? And the last bullet point I think is uh, kind of interesting because the scenarios that you're asked to disclose are based on short, medium, and long-term. And uh, some suggested benchmarks on that are shown there where 2025 is the short term. That's not far off. Um, and 2040 is the long term. That's not far off either. Um, for, for those of us who were around at Y2K, um, it's instructive to realize that we are closer to 2040 than we are to, 20, to Y2K looking in the rearview mirror. So, so that gives you an idea on, on the kind of planning that we're in for um, and the kind of strategies that companies will have to develop for these disclosures. And I'll remind you that these are disclosures in financial filings. And uh, as I've mentioned, and will continue to mention, internal audit has a role for ensuring the accuracy and the completeness of data and information that are included in financial filings. So um, let's take a minute now before we go on to the next topic and let's do another polling question. So if, if you were looking for making some kind of conscious investment, or whether it's diversity, inclusion, climate change, whatever issue is um, important to you in investment, what source of information would you find the most trustworthy? Let's take a minute and see what is coming in here with the votes. And we've got a horse race here. We have a lot of folks saying the analysts, the NGOs are trustworthy, the data and information in 10K is trustworthy. That's where a lot of people are looking for it. News media is a trusted source. Gotta love those investigative reporters. They do a great job. Company sustainability report is out there. I think what we're seeing in the polling results is there is no one answer. Um, and, and that's true, there is no one answer. Um, so this is both a, a challenge and it's both an opportunity for companies. And I think it's both a challenge and an opportunity for internal audit. Okay, in the home stretch here, um, let's talk about an investor focus. When it comes to non-financial reporting, it's hard to imagine um, folks who have more influence than the folks who hold the purse strings. Um, that's the case for our household budgets and that's the case in our, our families, that's the case in our companies. Well, that's the case when it comes to investors 
and they are all in on ESG. They are making decisions accordingly. Uh, Larry Fink is, is one of the most influential and visible folks in the investment world uh, as the head of BlackRock. In uh, January 2020, when they had $7 trillion in assets under management, uh, he included in his annual letter to CEOs that climate change is a defining factor in your long-term prospects. Um, in terms of whether you're going to profit, whether you're going to exist, whether you should be uh, an, an investment for this, this company, and BlackRock was doubling their offer of ESG-themed exchange traded funds to 150 in the year 2020. So then comes the question, well, who goes in that fund and how do they make those decisions? Well, they urge companies to make the disclosures in line with SASB so they can look in the 10K and get information that they regard as, as reliable. And if management does not comply, uh, then Larry Fink says, well, we're not going to vote for your management. We're, we're going to vote, we're going to uh, vote accordingly. In the last year with the pandemic uh, taking widespread attention, um, the expectation was that, that would put all of this on hold, but uh, actually the opposite happened. Um, Larry Fink and, and now they're more than 20% more of assets under management, they're growing that um, the investments in mutual funds that came into sustainable assets uh, nearly doubled over 2019. And in his letter, he doubled down and said, no, no company will be unaffected by this. Uh, we wanted you to report on TCFD and SASB and by golly, many of you came along, uh, a three and a half fold increase over SASB. And as I mentioned, over 1700 supporting TCFD. And now Larry Fink is asking companies to disclose a plan for how their business will be compatible with a zero net zero economy. Um, this again is, is showing how companies are having to think out of the four walls of the activities they control completely, that a net zero economy will require looking up the supply chain, looking at your manufacturing or your activities or what you do as an entity looking at how your product or service is used and looking at the product's end of useful life and, and thereafter. So where, where does climate change fit in in any of the risks of, of climate change all along that supply chain and value chain? Um, the trend is towards to making those changes net zero. So how will your company play a role? What's your strategy in that? And will you please disclose that in your financial filings so we can make our investment decisions accordingly? I focused a lot on climate change because of the prominence of TCFD, uh, but, but uh, Larry Fink is also emphasizing the importance of strategy of, for um, diversity and inclusion. And that is all kinds of diversity. That is gender diversity, religious diversity, creed, LGBTQ, um, all of that diversity really is, is going to matter going forward. So a few years back, I helped a, a client evaluate what they were doing compared to their peer companies, compared to companies in their, uh, where they were you know, hoping to maintain and build some customer relationships. <clears throat> and I compared their performance on a, a couple of parameters with a couple of their peers and we kind of color coded it to make a case to management on please, pretty please, let's get some more resources and improve our performance in these certain areas. And that client draft number one, you can see that it was not a really pretty story um, and that they were lagging their peers considerably. Uh, with a little bit of effort, we got them to the last column and client draft number two. Um, they didn't catch up, but uh, they were on their way um, and this was a, a graphic way to, uh, to depict where the company was relevant, relative to its peers and relative to the customers. Because the customer looking up the supply chain, making decisions on how to rate and rank and score the prospective uh, suppliers, ESG is becoming a, a factor. And 
I've seen situations where there were more points lost on ESG than some other factors where the company had been pouring resources for years. So the company did start to pay attention to this issue. This chart shows that they still had a ways to go. Well, that was, that was in 2015. Um, and since then has grown up a whole network of what is now called ecosystem of analysts. A lot of companies, uh, a lot of analysts go through the kind of thing we saw a, a little bit ago on the modern day slavery and human trafficking. Well, who does that analysis? And many shops have grown up and many of those shops have been acquired by the likes of Moody's, Standard and Poor's, Thomson Reuters, S&P Global. So all the big rating agencies are bringing this kind of analytics in house. Here are some of the prominent firms that are providing these kind of analysts to, uh, to the asset managers. But, you know, the ratings for conflict minerals and modern day slavery and diversity and inclusion, but there are at least 600 ESG ratings and rankings globally, and that was 2018. And they continue to grow. Um, there are 2,300 signatories to the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. Um, a couple of years ago, they had $80 trillion of assets under management. Well, what does responsible investment look like? You, you can look any one of 600 places. That industry is kind of consolidating, but uh, it's tempting to think that you can do an AI algorithm and come up with the best companies but um, that, that's turning out to be kind of impractical because the number of issues and the number of, um, of topics. So there is a, um, a firm called Sustainability, which was also acquired by another company a few years back. They put together a report called Rate the Raiders. Um, if there's so many analysts doing this, well, well who's the best? So they looked at a number of the, the large ones and they looked at the investors and analysts who use them. They put out this report that I think is, is pretty insightful and, and here's some highlights. That the majority of the investors and asset managers do use the ESG ratings and they use them at least once a week. Um, they use multiple ratings. Um, they don't necessarily buy into them completely. They begin with those ratings and they do a couple of things. They'll screen out the bad apples so that one chart we saw before, if your company is on the right side of that screen in not being, being a, among the poorest performers on a topic, you will not be in the exchange traded fund. You're out. If you're on the left, if you're rated as a darling of the industry and maybe consistently for a few years, well then your company may be selected to represent that sector in the exchange traded fund. But what the investors and analysts do is they'll take this data from all these analysts and they'll apply their own criteria, which is usually quite uh, proprietary on what else they do with it. This poses a challenge for companies because they, they see some of these ratings and they see who's in the funds and who's not, and they don't really know, it's hard to tell where it came from. Well, they're right because many of these uh, analysts are proprietary and the companies uh, won't necessarily see it. And despite all these analysts, there are some problems you see here. It's always backward looking. Uh, analysts are trying to look forward looking and evaluate companies for investments. Um, the analysts are, are not highly funded. Many of them may change a little bit with some of the acquisitions by, uh, by Moody's and Standard Poor's and the like. Uh, but the uh, updates are, let's say, annual, whereas investors are making decisions on a daily basis and they're looking forward and they're not looking backward. But uh, with 600 analysts out there and coming up with very vivid uh, graphics and very uh, data sets and tables like the one we saw a little bit ago, it has raised the awareness of this and it has um, investors asking a lot of questions that um, companies have to rise to the challenge and you have to, you have to answer. So what, what the investors are telling companies is, um, you know, here's, here's what we want from companies. We want regular reporting, we want better data. 
We want to know where the data came from. We want to know if it's verified. We want to know where you got it. Um, we want real-time data where possible. Uh, we heard uh, Dominique this morning talking about uh, she wants to do risk assessment on a daily basis. Well, the investors are asking her for information, including ESG information, on a daily basis. So ESG information right now is, is highly disaggregated with a, a lot of uh, systems and controls for compiling it that are, are not pulled together. Um, and the, the bar is being raised high and quickly in terms of the expectations of what investors want in order to make their investments. Besides the data, they want commitments from uh, and commentary on how leadership is looking at ESG, all the issues, and what they expect to do about it to raise the profile of companies and how it fits into the business strategy, which in turn will feed into the financial value creation or lack thereof. Climate change is on everybody's list. Um, so everybody will have to figure out what they're going to do about it. <clears throat> and one of the quotes that uh, was Bush is in the report is incremental is just not going to cut it anymore. The companies need to be more ambitious on this issue across the board. You cannot nibble at it. You cannot make incremental improvements. You've got to step up. So here's a next polling question with that in mind. Let's look to the screen. And when it comes to non-financial reporting at your organization, what is internal audit's role as we see today? And the responses are coming in. We have another horse race. No one option that is getting no answers so far is the defer to second line audit functions. Um, being on the EHS uh, audit center and, and being involved in environmental auditing for a long time, um, one of the campaigns I'm on is to challenge EHS audit to fundamentally rethink their strategy and their role. Um, especially in the wake of COVID, but uh, even a, a few years back. Um, I have some knowledge briefs on, on the IIA website that the, um, legacy, the, the second line audit functions, many of them are still rooted in mitigating the risk of uh, regulatory enforcement, whereas the risks have changed over the years. And I think uh, a lot of them are due for a complete makeover and that's another thing for internal audit to uh, put in your audit plan if you have a second line audit function. But it looks like um, the leading answers are that you, you really think that leadership is a, a good way to go. Reviewing internal controls over non-financial reporting picked up about one vote out of seven, 13%. Um, I think there are a lot of good answers here. I only allowed you to pick one but uh, I hope as you were making the, your decision on voting, you were hoping you could vote for a lot of these because uh, I don't think there's a, a wrong answer, except uh, the last three are not particularly strong, but you have to, if you have to start, you have to do something. So for risk and internal audit focus, as we uh, kind of bring it home here, um, in risk assessment, here are the four familiar categories of risk from the original COSO, which I still um, find very easy to understand. The original categories, uh, non-financial reporting was in there if you just knew how to add it. Compliance is just law, not laws and regulations. It's things like the contracts we've seen. Non-financial reporting has, has grown like crazy, was not really in the picture in 2004. Um, I would say also that uh, let, let's think back a couple decades on, on fraud. Uh, the, the Cressy Triangle came out in the 1950s. It was a big change on how businesses are done in, in 50 years. But then there's more changes on how business is done in the 2010s and, and now the 2020s. That business does not look the same as it does um, before. 
And with all the um, reporting on non-financial that goes to investors um, and the highly disaggregated systems and controls, um, when, when money's involved, there is an incentive. Flat out, there's an incentive. If there are poor controls or no controls, there is the opportunity. The rationalization could be the attitude, well, it's only my little area. Well, the structure isn't there, so the company doesn't care about it. Well, it's not my job. Or somebody else is doing it. Or, you know, it's this is a voluntary report without understanding where it goes. Well, it's only four points on our score with the customer. There are a lot of rationalizations. And if the potential for fraud is there, people will find it and, and people will use it. Um, so when it comes to approaching this issue from a risk mitigation point or an audit standpoint, um, I encourage you to think about fraud. Uh, I have a website, environmentalfraud.com, that's devoted just to this. Um, and I'm fortunate in being in-house at a big four in 2002 when Sarbanes-Oxley came out that uh, right from the start, we were required to include procedures to detect fraud on supporting financial audits then on internal audits from the get-go. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that I have built fraud detection um, into environmental audits and ESG audits now for close to 20 years. So uh, it can be done, but it, that's the exception and not the rule. So um, the traditional approach to, to managing this ESG or the non-financial reporting risks is you know, the company kind of goes back and forth with customers, regulators. It's kind of a linear thing. Uh, it, it's kind of reactionary if, if you want to know. Um, but I think this is a better model for how ESG requirements um, enter the company and how the risk should be looked at, where information flows. Um, the analogy of the shopping cart, we like the smooth shopping cart. If there's a chunk out of the wheel, you get that clunk, 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 clunk. And if you can't find a good cart, you go to another store. So um, this, the reporting is happening in all of these channels. The data has to be good and reliable in all of these channels. If there's a chunk out of any portions of these wheels, people will go to another store. They will go to another company for their supplier, for their employer, for their investment. So, um, I, I hope you take a look at this model. It, it's, uh, I think, pretty elegant. And the more you look at it, the more I think it will sink in. Um, it is not just a flip, it's not just a risk. Uh, it is an opportunity. Larry Fink cited plenty of research that says there is a sustainability premium in the investment and performance. Um, inclusion in the stock funds that we've doubled down on that at BlackRock in the last two years. Uh, customers like dealing with a company that has an ESG consciousness, especially on the issues that align with their priorities. You know, that simple chart we saw before, what matters to our key customers. Um, you may get a reduced insurance premium. You may have to chase that and ask for it. Um, and you, I think there's a lot to be said about improving uh, the, and att the attraction and retention of the talent you want to keep. Um, that that it works out well for everybody. So what would I tell an internal auditor to do? Um, you know, please continue to follow this issue. It is moving so fast. Um, when, when I've reported before on changes, just since the prior year, I'm in the middle of this all the time, as Annette mentioned, kind of as a standards wonk and reading this. And, you know, I'm immersed in it and I'm amazed by it. When I step back and look year on year, it's just astonishing, the pace of change in this field. Ask questions, ask a lot of questions. There's no dumb question. Um, ask questions, not just as part of an ESG audit, but in part of any audit. Is there ESG audit component in third-party risk management? Yeah, what is it? Oh, we don't know, there's a risk. Um, find out where ESG lives in your company. It probably lives at three, four, seven, nine places. Um, and please find out who's responsible um, I've seen so many times the people put in charge of ESG were people who thought it was a good idea to, to print on both sides of the paper uh, or do something that is just kind of soft and nice so it was given to them by default. This is a business imperative. It has to go to people who know business issues, who know business processes, and who know 
how to manage risk and how to compile data. It's got to go to people who can do this for your company. And, and you don't, just like SASB says, you don't have to new, get a new law to, to make disclosures in your 10K. You don't need a new standard or new guidance to do this as part of your role as internal audit. It's in the IPPF, it's in your mission, it's in your charter to find risk, to mitigate risk, to add, ask questions and to add value. And, and you know, it is a little self-serving, but I will say, you know, please use specialists. Um, it, this is so much to bite off on your own, especially when internal audit is spread thin. Like we've heard, you get to visit and go to all parts of the company and they're all different. Um, you can't know everything about everything. God bless you for going everywhere and asking everything. Uh, but please use a specialist to help focus in on some of the better issues um, and, and to leave a lot of stuff to the side that maybe is not as impactful. So um, I don't know, Annette, if we have uh, any questions. We might have a few minutes left, but uh, I packed a lot into the time we have to <laughs> so What have we got? True, true. And we just 